Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We are coming to the end of our series on the Apostles' Creed, and if you remember, we started back in the middle of August talking about what is a creed and what does it mean to say, I believe. Uh, We then spent a week looking at what it means to say that God is our Father who created us, and then we spent a couple of weeks talking about the second article, which is all about Jesus. We talked about his humanity and his divinity. We talked about what does it mean to say that Jesus will come to judge both the living and the dead. And then two weeks ago, we spent some time talking about the Holy Spirit and what his work is. And next week, we're going to wrap up this whole series by talking about what does it all mean for us? What happens after this life? We spoke the words of the Apostles' Creed just a little bit ago, but let's remind ourselves what the third article says. It says, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. And two weeks ago, Pastor Tom did a great job reminding us what the work of the Holy Spirit is, that his job really is to point us back to what Jesus has done for us. And that sets up our sermon for today because we are talking about the Holy Christian Church and the communion of saints below us here on earth and above those who are with our Lord. And I want to key in on one particular verse from our gospel reading for today. It's Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades, or the gates of hell, will not overcome it. Now let me give you a little context. Jesus has made his way to Caesarea Philippi, the the northernmost point in which he would do ministry, and the people are wondering about Jesus. The disciples had been with the people as he taught and performed miracles. They were hanging out with the crowds every day. And so Jesus asked them, who do people, who do the crowds say that the Son of Man is? And the disciples begin to answer. Some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah or Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Now they had good reason for these guesses. There was a prophecy that Elijah would return before the Messiah would appear. They couldn't quite figure out who Jesus is. And so Jesus has the disciples ask them. He knew that there were many different ideas and thoughts about who he was. Some thought that the Messiah was going to be an earthly king, someone who would drive out the evil Roman Empire who had taken control of their land. Some thought that Jesus was a great leader and teacher. Others thought he was just a a miracle worker. And still others thought he was just another itinerant preacher wandering around talking about God. And so Jesus finally turns to the disciples and he asks them, did they understand who he was? Did they understand the mission? What did they believe about Jesus and what he had come to do? Would they be able to carry out his work after he would leave? Most knew that Jesus had been set apart. They knew that there was something special about him, but not quite sure what. Jesus asked the disciples, who do you say I am? And Peter steps to the plate. He's the the bold spokesman for the group. Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answers him, and I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. You know, essentially what Jesus is doing here is he's he's using a play on words. Jesus is saying, I'm not going to build my church on you, Peter, but I will build my church on the confession that you just made about the true rock, the truth that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. Peter, yes, your your name means rock, but you are not the rock on which the church is founded. Peter, you will be the initial rock, the first one who discovers and grasps who I am, and therefore you will be the first, the living stones of the church. And in the ages to come, everyone who makes that same discovery, who has that same confession, they will be another stone in the church. But the foundation, 
The foundation is the confession that I, Jesus, am the Christ, the Son of the living God, and it's on that confession that the church is built. You know, the church is built when people who are sinners receive the forgiveness that Jesus alone can offer. When people who think that they could never be forgiven, when people who receive the forgiveness of Jesus that takes away the anger and the bitterness, the guilt, the shame, the grief, the sting of past mistakes, when people receive forgiveness, that's when the church is built. The church is built on Jesus. It's built on his cross and empty tomb that assures us, that gives us hope and peace and joy, not just because we have the forgiveness of sins, but because the victory over sin, death, and the devil that is ours because of him. Now, as hard as it is to believe, and, and even as a pastor, I gotta remind myself of this from time to time. The church is not built on programs or social ministries, a building or even a personality. Yeah, those may be good things, but they are not what makes a church. A church is built on the forgiveness of sins and the understanding that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Church really begins on that Pentecost day. After Jesus died and has risen from the dead and ascended into heaven, Peter preaches this amazing sermon and over 3,000 people come to faith and the church is growing by leaps and bounds in those early days and I would remind you that the church is still growing today even though you and I, we may not always see it. And so as we talk about the holy Christian church, it's on that foundation of the confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son, and the living God. You see, no matter if people speak a different language, no matter if people look differently than you and me, no matter where we go, those who share that confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, they are a part of the church. They are brothers and sisters in Christ. The challenge is that Jesus in this text said, I will build my church. Not you, not me, not the pastor. It's not our job to build the church, but it's our job to scatter the seed, to spread the word. And Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, through the gift of faith, he makes it grow. And Luther does a great job of explaining this to us in his explanation of the third article of the Apostles' Creed. Here's what he says. The Holy Spirit calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies the whole Christian church on earth. The whole Christian church, the, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints. And when we say that the church is holy, it actually comes from a Greek word. The word is agios, meaning set apart for God. We are a holy people. 1 Peter 2 verse 9 says, You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God for a purpose that you may declare the praises of him who calls you out of darkness into his marvelous light. At one time you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. See, we have been set apart as a church. We are to be a holy people who are to live lives that bring glory and honor to our God. And sometimes this is where the the Christian life gets a little challenging. Because to be holy means that we may have to go against the tide of popularity. To be holy means that sometimes we have to swim upstream against the world and the culture in which we live because to go with the stream leads to destruction. Holiness, it means to walk in the light, to be salt and light to the world. To be holy means that we see, that people would actually see that we are different than the rest of the world, that our hope, our joy, it is bigger than this life. What makes us holy isn't that we just come to church on Sunday morning. It's a good place to start. But what do we do? What do we do with the gifts that we receive here in church throughout the week? What do we do with the mercy and the forgiveness and the grace, the good news, the, the love, the joy that should fill our hearts 
that we hear proclaimed week after week, what do we do with that after we leave this place, after we drive off that parking lot? You know, we say that we're Christians, that we're followers of Christ, and the church is, is built on the saving name of Jesus. But the church is also made of, of people. Sometimes the New Testament, it uses the word church to talk about all of God's people all over the world. In theology, this is what's called the universal church. And here at St. Paul, we are a part of the church in Sheboygan County. Uh, we are a part of the local church. The church is universal, but also local. And the word for church in Greek is ekklesia. It means an assembly called out. And so we are holy people set apart who profess the name of Jesus, who assemble together to be called out into the world. And as the church, we confess that Jesus is our Lord and Savior. Peter confesses Jesus as the Christ, the Son of the living God, and Jesus replied, and I tell you, Peter, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against her. The Bible tells us that Jesus is the head of the church and that we are his body. But what Satan does is he works tirelessly to separate Christ from the church and the church from Christ because he knows that if he can separate the head from the body, the body dies. But the promise that we have here in this passage is that Satan will never win. You see, when Jesus died and rose again, he proved his power over sin, death, and the devil. And local churches, they may come and go, but the universal church will never fail. When we profess, that, when we confess that we believe in the holy Christian church and the communion of saints, it's not only the universal church, but it's also the local church. It is St. Paul. And the the church is established by Christ, it's united by Christ, it's built by Christ, and the best thing that any church can do is proclaim the gospel, the word of God in its fullness, in its purity and truth, to proclaim that the Bible is the infallible word of God, to proclaim the forgiveness of sins, not based on works, but solely on what Jesus has done for you and for me. But the church is also you. You are the church. Eugene Peterson, famous pastor and Bible scholar, said this. He said, there are no successful churches. There are communities of sinners gathered before God week after week in towns all over the world. And in these communities of sinners, one of the sinners is called pastor. The local church is made up of people who believe in Jesus as their savior and they are called out and assembled together to be the body of Christ. The church is made up of, of caring people and grace-filled people, kind people, generous people, people who are hurting, struggling, and grieving, people who are trying to hold it all together, people who are living day by day, week by week, people who wanna grow in their faith, who wanna grow in their love for Jesus. But in that same church, you may also find Opinionated people, and cranky people, grumpy people, mean-spirited people. If you're looking around, don't. <laughs> if you're looking at your spouse, I saw that. <laughs> there may be arrogant people, people who are insecure, critical, and angry. And if you doubt that these people exist, I think all that we have to do is go home and look in the mirror because we are those people. I know that I have the ability to be all of those things and so do you. Because the truth is, is that we are all sinners in need of God's grace. We may let each other down, we may say or do something that hurts one another because we are sinners, but as sinners we live by God's grace. We live with the confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and so no matter what may happen, we cannot give up on that. One writer put it this way, he said, to live above with the saints that we love, that will be glory, but to live below with the saints that we know, that's another story. 
Yes, the people in the church may be broken sinners, but they are also the blessing of the church. Take away the people and there is no church. The Apostles' Creed, it challenges us to set aside our misconception, our frustrations, our expectations of the perfect church. The Apostles' Creed, it helps us to make the confession that I believe in the Holy Christian Church, that with all her faults and blemishes, with all the sinners who are looking for God's grace, their grace is present. There the words of Jesus are spoken and taught. There his gifts are given. Even when the church lets us down, even when the pastor makes a decision that I don't like, even when the pastor says something that irritates and bothers you. You know, as your pastor, I hope you know, I hope you know how much I love all of you. And yet I've begun to realize that the longer I'm here, the greater the chance is is that I will eventually say something that offends you. I talk a lot. (laughs) Kind of goes with the job. You know, sometimes I say things I don't mean or sometimes words don't come out the way I wanted. That ever happened to anyone? And as soon as the words leave our lips, we wish we could just reach out and grab them and pull them back, but that's, that's not the way things work. We need to say, I believe in the Holy Christian Church and the communion of saints just as much as we need to say, I believe in Jesus Christ. We need to affirm the fact that the church exists because God is the one who built it. That although the church may be full of sinners, people who are in need of grace and forgiveness, that it's still worth attending, it's still worth being a part of, it's still worth believing in, because there, Jesus and the Holy Spirit are at work. St. Paul Lutheran Church, that's our, our name. That's who we are. And when you think about church, I want you to think about it in three ways. St. Paul, Lutheran, and Church. Our church is named after St. Paul, the greatest missionary of all time. Our our church is named after someone who exemplified what our mission of connecting people to Christ is really all about. He took the word of God all over the earth. He proclaimed God's word. He shared the truth of God's love and mercy in Jesus everywhere he went. Lutheran then ties us to a historic and denominational identity as a congregation of the Missouri Synod. And because of that, we have certain doctrines and beliefs. It helps us to know what we believe, and it even has tools and resources to help us live out our lives as Christians. But I would argue that perhaps the most important part of our name is the word church. It is the focus of our labor. We are the local church. We are an assembly of people who confess Jesus as Lord, who have been called out of the world to live and to share the world, share the word with the world. This is God's church because he is the head and we are the body. We belong to him. Jesus said he would build his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Wherever Peter's confession is found in the church, we join the universal church. Wherever that uh, profession is proclaimed, there we find the communion of saints who are also sinners, people in need of the grace and forgiveness of God. The church belongs to Christ, her head. He is the one who unites it, establishes it, grows it, and builds it. Jesus is the head, and we are the body. And as members of this body, we all have different talents, gifts, and skills that we can use within the body. We are better and stronger together as a communion of saints. But it's hard when we don't show up. You see, we need to gather together to fellowship and to encourage and support one another as we live our lives as Christians in this world. We are the body of Christ. We are the assembled church, the local gathering of the universal church. But the reality is, is that not one of us can be the church all by ourselves, all alone. We need others. I know that many of you sit in the same pew week after week after week. 
What if after church you took a moment to meet, to get the names and the phone numbers of the other people who sit in the pew around you week after week after week? And in two weeks when they're not here, you gave them a call and told them that the body of Christ was missing something, that they weren't here, and that they were loved and missed, and that you care. Let me tell you, it would be greater than any follow-up phone call I will ever make. We are better together. Yes, the universal church, it can be divided and weak in times, but it will prevail. The leaders of the church, they can make decisions that we don't like and fail, and yet the church will prevail. Sometimes the service, it can be dull and boring, and the pastor's sermon can go on and on and on. When will it end? But the church will prevail. No matter what, the church will prevail because Jesus said so. And so here's what I wanna encourage you to do. I wanna encourage you to pray for the church. Pray for the leaders, pray for the pastors, pray for those who volunteer and serve, pray for your fellow members of the body of Christ and pray that God would embolden you because you are a part of the church. You with all of your faults and all of your sins, you are a part of the communion of saints because Jesus died for you. He shed his blood for you. He has poured out his life for you. He has washed you clean. He has called you by name and he has invited you to be a part of his family. And that family called out to be salt and light to the this world called to be the body of Christ, we come together and we gather week after week after week. We gather around to hear his words, to receive his gifts, so that we might show and reflect his love and his grace in word and action everywhere we go, so that many more would know the love of our God and be connected to Christ. And so come, receive his gift, share his love, wherever you may go, be the church. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.